Hey there, aspiring comedians and comedians. Welcome to Greg Dean's Stand-Up Comedy Classes. This is the free seminar. My level one workshops and classes, okay? They're available in person uh, in Santa Monica and on Zoom, live teaching with that as well. How to build a routine. Probably the very first thing you really need to know when you get into stand-up comedy. And there are a plethora of skills that you need to know in order to be able to just do that. A lot of people are really shocked by how much they actually have to learn because you're the writer uh, and the performer and also your director, producer, and uh, you, your PR person, you're everything. So we'll prepare you for all of those things. Uh, I wanted to uh, go through them and uh, show you all of the different things I teach because not all stand-up comedy teachers are alike. Uh, some of them, many of them will put you up on stage right away, even at a major club. And uh, I personally think that's too soon because they don't really teach you anything. That's what this is about. So I can talk about what I actually am going to teach you to do. All right, and, and I think you'll be a little shocked at, at how much we're covering tonight and the class itself will cover a lot more. So let's move right along. First of all, congratulations. You, you've just taken, just being here, you've taken your first step to uh, turning your dreams into reality. You'd be surprised how many people sign up for this free class and don't even show up for it because uh, of fear, fear. I understand stand-up comedy is terrifying, yet we have a lot of things to help you through that too. And a big part of that is knowing what you're doing and feeling prepared. So congratulations just for being here because a lot of people want to, but very few people actually take the steps. So how to become a comedian. There are three levels to my particular classes, okay? So the first one is the one I'm talking about here, which is level one, how to build a, a routine. Very important. That's really the first step because you're not going to feel good going to the open mics or any of the shows until you kind of have something to do and feel good and uh, confident about that routine to get up in front of people and take a shot at it. Once you go through this class and everyone is required, it is a prerequisite. And you'll understand as I go through this webinar, how important it is because I have so much uh, language that I need to teach you about uh, that. So, but after, right after that, okay, once you finish this class, you go right into my level two classes, which is writing an actual show and performing at the improv. Woohoo, man, I'm telling you, that's really powerful. Go through that a few times till you start to really get some material. Level three is then we start giving you some specialized training on uh, doing uh, how to be an MC and how to do crowd work. Those will really accentuate, uh, accelerate <laughs> your comedy career because you know, when you get out there, you're gonna see most of the MCs out there are terrible. When you become a really good MC and you have some material, everybody's going to want you on their stage. And it's not really a level four, but really after that, what we find is uh, we people uh, pass up the uh, open mics really quickly and they get into uh, working rooms and then clubs and then they quickly become working comedians. Uh, of course, depending on how hard you work at it. Right now, what we're talking about is level one, how to build a routine. So here are some of the things that my students are saying about my classes. Greg teaches you how to actually write a joke. I mean, you go to an open mic and, and no one there knows how, what a joke is. And then you go there and you do, and then you tell one and you actually get laughs unlike most other people. Well, Greg was my first stand-up class ever. So I, I don't think I, I never would have done it if it wasn't for him. You helped me to kind of dive deep into what makes me funny and then help me bring that out. And makes me also feel more safe to try new things and kind of be more, I don't know, be more, take more risks. This is the biggest shortcut, because I'm talking about years of shortcut uh, into learning and through the process. 
Well, there you go. A few of my students talking about what they've learned and the results that they got. The last one that talked about how this is a shortcut. He became a paid headliner within one year and three months of taking the class you were, you were looking at uh, right now, really that quickly. Uh, of course, he worked hard and uh, people asked him, well, well how, how did you do that? He was like, well, uh, I just did everything Greg taught me to do. Uh, and that's pretty much it. He embraced the technique. He took the other seminars. He took the, the class about how to, how to make money all of those things and worked really hard and followed the kind of not the formula but the steps headliner okay so uh that's what anybody can do with a little bit of hard work next i'll talk about my credentials uh, i'm not super fun about me talking about myself so this is rather short and i'll have another video that goes more deeply into many of the things that I've done in my lifetime, which is a lot of odd things. Uh, it's fun, but uh, it, just first of all, I'm a paid regular at the Comedy Store. As far as I know, I still am, even though I haven't performed there in years. My name's on the wall. Just go to the Comedy Store. You'll see my name down there and stuff. And I got that, uh, a, you know, a while back. And uh, But as far as I know, I'm still a paid regular. I've just retired from stand-up. Next is teaching stand-up comedy. I was the first stand-up comedy school in the world. I started in 1982. Wow, there was a class here and there, but not a school. Not a full-blown school with with books and curriculums and a process for you to actually learn step-by-step step the things you need to do to become a stand-up comedian. Uh, here are some of the places that I've taught. I've taught at the Improv. I taught at the Comedy Store in Hollywood and La Jolla and uh, San Jose. The Comedy Nest in Montreal, I taught there, did a big, huge weekend there. That was a whole lot of fun. Here in town, I did the Ha Ha Cafe, had a school running there for a while, as well as the Comedy Chateau. So those are the things I've done over the years. I mean, I've been teaching for over 40 years now. So. I thought, you know, hopefully I've learned a few things about how to take this knowledge and, and give it to you. Also, I'm a part of the International Society of Humor Studies, which is, that's about 5,000 PhDs all over the world and me. <laughs> I'm like the blue collar humor theorist. Uh, they do, they do a lot of comedy research. And by the way, they are really funny people, by the way. Yet they do research for uh, academics, for academics. So a lot of their stuff isn't practical in the real world. My stuff has to be. That's why they asked me to come and teach at the World Humor Conferences. I've been to, uh, well, I've been to four. Four major ones and a lot of others they've invited me and I couldn't make it because it was in other parts of the world. So I usually do the ones here in the U.S. Also, I worked with Tony Robbins uh, for about eight months, I would say. Uh, it was a great experience. Uh, I was his actually his personal assistant for a while. Okay, and if you know anything about what he teaches, which is NLP, I'm an uh, NLP master practitioner and master trainer certified. And also, along with Tony, I did a 30 foot fire walk. Great metaphor because you think you can't do it and you can. That's that's the big teaching is, oh my gosh, goodness, I can't possibly do that. And then when you do it, you kind of go, well, what else in the world do I think I can't do? And I can really do it except for my mind is holding me back. Powerful. Next is uh, my alumni. Uh, how many people have, I can't cover them all. I, it literally goes, um, let me cover a few. First of all, Whoopi Goldberg, I trained her. Uh, back in the day, and she just said, I studied with Greg Dean, and uh, look where I am today. That was uh, one of my students didn't believe me and wrote her, and she wrote him back. Uh, Anthony Jesselnik, uh, one of my, he was dark, and you know, he said, okay, and I went, if it's honest, yeah, that's who you really are, that's fine, you know, and he said, I learned joke writing from the best. Sherry Shepard, uh, she's one of my students as well. She's done really well, has a lot of major television shows, performs all over with a lot of my other students. Like I saw recently they were on the same bill was uh, Christina P. She goes by Christina Pajitsky. Uh, she's got Netflix special uh, Mother Inferior and uh, 
your mom's home uh, podcast with her husband, Tom Segura. I took a comedy class, which was mine, and I fell in love with it, which is uh, the class and stand-up comedy. So I could go on for quite a while, yet I think uh, I, point's been made, I think, here. Next is uh, my books. Uh, my main book is Step by Step to Stand-Up Comedy. I put it out in uh, 2000 and then updated it in 2018. You can get it in paperback, uh, ebook, and audiobook, which I recorded myself. I actually did it and I learned something. I'll never do that again because I'm slightly lisdexic. And uh, so I start reading and the words aren't the ones on the ones I'm reading are not the ones on the paper. But I got through it and I did it and it turned out quite well, I thought. Uh, also, it's in five languages, uh, uh, Mandarin, Chinese, uh, you know, simple and complex, uh, Vietnamese, French, Spanish, uh, it's, and people are still writing to want to turn it. There's a reason for this, uh, because, of course, they change the language, duh, and they also have to change the jokes, because sometimes jokes are cultural. Some of them work across cultures and some of them don't, so they got to replace them, but they never replace Okay, the techniques that I've outlined, the structures like joke structure, okay, or the processes, the joke writing processes, the, the rehearsal process, all of the things that I put into this book, they keep all those because those are the fundamentals for stand up comedy. And uh, I guess they had a chance to publish a lot of American books, but they keep choosing me, I think, because. My book is a book of techniques. I, I loved it when I first published it. People would say, it's very technical. It's a very technical book. And I said, yes, it's a book of techniques. Oh, well, there's also my workbooks, okay? Uh, so you can kind of parse up the different parts of all these amazing amount of techniques that you're gonna learn, which is one is how to write joke, probably the one that's out there. And, and there's actually a lot of classes being taught off of this one as well around, uh, around the world, I think. How to improve jokes and routines. That's the second most popular because people want to improve those. And then pretty much running in there is how to remember jokes naturally. I think one of my best books, uh, people really have to get in and read it, understand the rehearsal process and all. Uh, how to be a funnier performer, a lot of, lot of uh, suggestions and things for that. Things to help you with the performing. And the last one's how to get the experience. How to get out there and, and get the experience so you can go out and become a professional comedian, which I think is the goal. <laughs> Developing the fundamentals. Now, when I began in 1982, a long time ago, 40 some odd years ago, uh there there were no real no fundamentals out there okay so uh there was no real book there were no books there were no anything uh, the best one was a book on writing radio for for jack benny and bob hope were the best uh best one i found for writing some jokes and stuff later some came along by steve allen and a few other people and steve allen actually loved my book and asked me if he could write a forward for my book. So that was a, a, a very huge compliment. So uh, let me just go on. So here's one of my places that I really want you to understand that I started, okay? Which is you can get really get lost or you can go right for the sunshine here, which is the only shortcut to mastering anything difficult and complex is learning and practicing the fundamentals the class objective overall so that you know what you're going to get overall just a big overall as, as i develop these uh these fundamentals the class itself teaches a series of very specific things you will learn and practice uh, the technique practice the techniques and skills needed to write organize and perform a stand-up comedy routine i think that's pretty much said in the title but i wanted you to know that's what it's about it's about that you know, I have a very specific focus. I've got a lot of stuff to teach. What I'm teaching in this class is focused very much on this, as I will show you right now. First of all, you're going to learn joke structure, not a uh, joke structure you'll find on YouTube. My joke structure, Greg Dean's joke structure. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. OK, you're going to learn to uh, write jokes, edit and fix jokes tell funny stories there's a lot of fundamentals people don't realize that are really necessary for uh telling funny stories 
Okay, because you can do a lot of things that mess up a very funny story and make a funny story unfunny. Assembling a routine seems obvious, but there's a lot of technique behind that as well. Managing your stage fright, yes. There are things that once you learn them and know how to do them, the stage fright becomes more minimal. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. This is a, a, like a table of contents. You'll perform with confidence and have a routine. Have a routine at the end of this. Have a short routine, okay? And you'll know how you built it. It won't just be happenstance. Oh, I hope I, you're gonna learn all of these things that lead you to performing with confidence and having a routine at the end. So very important, all these steps in here. How it all started in 1982. Back to developing the fundamentals in 1982, there were almost no fundamentals. I'm telling you, there was there was okay. Here's the one. There there were a few, but not much. This was one of them. It was the two list joke writing system. I learned it from another teacher. A couple of them actually that were teaching joke writing, not stand up, but teaching joke writing. Here's how it goes. So I just want you to understand these kinds of fundamentals and how clear they are. Okay, step one: pick a subject and make an association list. Okay, sounds pretty good. So you pick a subject like hospital, make an association list, doctors, nurses, ER, operation, blah, 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 blah. Step number two, give that subject a trait and make an association list about that trait. Okay, and I chose torture. Hospitals are like torture. Okay, okay, waterboarded, sleeping, uh, sleep deprivation, loud music, and all the other things, pulling off your fingernails and all kinds of other fun things. Okay, now get ready. Step number three, Write jokes. Yeah, that's right. Write jokes. Uh, what? Write jokes. Now, this system works really well if you already have a model in your head of what a joke is. Okay. 50% of my students wrote some jokes. I wrote a good deal of jokes from this system. Okay. Because I kind of, I don't know how where I got it, but I did, I, you know, and I could write some jokes from this, okay? And 50% of my students says, I don't know what a joke is, so how, I don't, how am I supposed to write a joke? I don't know what a joke, how am I supposed, I, I don't know what you want me to do. <laughs> and I had to listen to them. Uh, at first I was an idiot going, of course you do. You know how to write one. <laughs> Stupid, uh, but that was in the beginning. Uh, but I listened and I went, wow, that's, Wow, that's 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 profound. I mean, oh, how am I going to teach people joke writing if I if I don't you know if I don't even know what a joke is? And so, that was the question: What is a joke? And the answer took me seventeen years to solve. Seventeen years to come up with a complete model. It come in bits and pieces for many years, but I have to tell you, it. Uh, it's a lot of work and a lot of reading, and a lot of study and a lot of listening, and a lot of looking at a lot of jokes and a lot of performers, hundreds and hundreds. Of, I wouldn't it would, maybe thousands. Yeah, I'd say thousands. From there, I had to do the invention of joke structure. First of all, I had to answer a question. What is a joke? And then I had to kind of find a way to communicate it to people. Uh, I could kind of understand it, but then there were there were mechanisms in it that, that no one had ever identified and they didn't have names. So I had to learn how to do that. I coined the phrase joke structure to explain the mechanisms uh, that connected the setup and the punch or the first part of the joke and the second part of the joke. That's what joke structure is in my world. It's the, it's the mechanisms between the setup and the punch, not setup and punch. They're just the way we go about expressing uh, one-liners. Uh, that's no different than saying cartoon or sitcom or uh, sketch. They're all just ways of expressing humor. So uh, here they are. These are the definitions of these three mechanisms. First, you really have to understand this. At the center of all jokes, there's always one thing with two meanings. At the center of all jokes on this planet that have ever been and ever will be, there's one thing with two meanings or interpretations. Okay, please do not believe me, be a skeptic. Because if you're a skeptic, you'll do some research into this and find out that, that I'm right about this. And there's a lot of people that disagree with me on it and cool, that's good. 
that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because it starts a dialogue and people start talking about it. And people send me jokes all the time and I send it right back to them going, here it is. Now, don't do that because I stopped <laughs> correcting those jokes because I got thousands of them and I can't keep up with them. So sorry that uh, there's that. So here's the first thing is uh, 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 one thing with two meanings. Now, the setup actually gives you the expected meaning one thing with two meanings okay and that's how you misdirect an audience they accept the expected meaning and in the punch there is a mechanism there which is the unexpected meaning that's what creates the surprise expectation and surprise a lot of people talk about that comedy teachers talk about that like that's some new information that came from socrates and aristotle so, <laughs> so these three things, keep these in mind because I go along, you're going to start to see how this relates to so many things. When you learn joke structure, first of all, you learn how to identify jokes. Identifying jokes, very important. Where the hell is the joke? People bring me uh, stuff all the time in private, especially, and they'll have notebooks and notebooks. And I'll say, well, let's work on one. They'll take out a full page. It'll be a full page. Uh, and I'll say, well, it's only got one joke because there's only one, one, one time. Do you have one thing with two and two meanings in there? And then I'll help them shorten the joke. And I say, is that the joke you're trying to say? And they went, oh yeah, that's exactly it. Yet they wrote and wrote because they didn't know where the joke was. They didn't know how to precisely write, precisely write the joke. So they keep wandering around, identifying where the joke is. Wow, that's paramount. That's, that's a big place to begin, okay? So that's what you're going to learn. Here, we're going to actually do it right now. Emma Willman, uh, she was a private. She did private with me and stuff. Listen to this joke. I have the ADHD. I was diagnosed in high school, and I was prescribed Adderall, which was a godsend because my grades were able to skyrocket because I could finally focus on trading my Adderall for the test answers. <laughs> that's what happened. Okay, so let's identify this joke. My grade skyrocketed because I could focus on trading my Adderall for the test answers. What was the one thing with two meanings? It's what she could focus on. The expected meaning, we expected her to say I could focus on my studying. Mm, no, no, she traded drugs for the cheat sheets. Now you understand how that joke works, okay? That's her joke. That's that's a great joke. Okay, nice, crisp, clear, but it's also about her as well. Very important to do that. Next is Anthony Jeselnik, one of my students uh, as well. Okay, so here we go, Anthony. My brother's crazy. Even my neighbors hate him. The other day I opened up the door, I caught him masturbating. He looks me right in the eyes and goes, shut the door. <laughs> I said, get inside. <laughs> okay, so let's identify Anthony's joke. He said, shut the door. I said, get inside. Can't write out the whole thing. So what's the one thing with two meanings? Oh, you might be thinking it's the door. It's kind of it, but it's really where the brother was at while he was masturbating. We assumed because of the door that it was his bedroom, the bedroom door. Instead, it was probably the front door because he was because he was outside where the, the neighbors could see him. Understand why they hate him. So, uh, yeah, there's the structure of this joke. And Anthony was one of my students. He really got joke structure from it. He understands joke structure. That's why his jokes are so good. The next thing you'll learn is how to fix jokes. I'm actually gonna show you how to fix a joke here real quick, how to edit one. First of all, here's the joke. I just went through a long and messy separation, which ended with in divorce from my wife. So after all that, I went on a vacation to Denmark because I was going to have a sex change. The sex change was from not very often to nothing at all, not my gender. Wow. Okay, a little overwritten all over here, I think. Okay, let's fix this joke. So the first thing you need to do is identify the joke. Remember I was talking about that? What's the structure of this joke? What's the one thing with two meanings? Sex change. Because the expected meaning, we expect him to say a change in sex organs. Okay, 
and it would be a uh, change in sexual frequency. Sex change. Oh, okay. Now you're starting to understand this. See, isn't this fun? This is amazing because I love the teaching this to people because as you, you watch someone go, <clears throat> man, is nothing more fun than that and watching people really start to understand jokes for the first time in their lives and they want to be funny people like you. So uh, for fixing jokes, I love what Patton Oswald said. He said, in stand-up comedy, you strip out everything except what serves the joke. Now, I just showed you what serves the joke. That's what serves the joke. The least amount for the setup to say that you got a sex change and the least amount you need to say in the unexpected interpretation about it was a change in frequency. Now, let's start to take it apart. First of all, do it sentence by sentence. I just went through a long and messy separation, which ended in a divorce from my wife. Okay, do I really need to know it was long and messy to, for the joke to work and, and that it was a separation and stuff? Well, no, all that's there because it's a divorce, which ended in a divorce. Well, that's kind of all you have to do is kind of say divorce. And do you need to say from my wife? Well, if you're a straight man saying the joke, no. If you're other than that, you may need to explain things. But for this joke, this was written by a straight gentleman. So I know that that's what it is. So what do we need from this particular first sentence? Uh, not much. Divorce. <laughs> that's it. But you can't get out there and just go, divorce! All right, so you have to kind of take some of the language there and change it, say, after my divorce, because, you know. <laughs> so after all that, we can pretty much probably get rid of that. I, I went on a vacation to Denmark because I was going to have a sex change. Do I need to know you went on a vacation? And did I need to know it was after that? I mean, pretty much just the fact that intense in, you know, uh, how this is written that you know that it was afterwards, it wasn't before. Um, I don't need to know you went on a vacation. You're right, it's called rationalization. You're rationalizing why you did that. And I wanna take all rationalizations out. You don't need them because they don't serve the joke. That's what you want. They don't serve the joke. Take it out. So let's look at it. We don't need any of this. <laughs> after all that, no, you know, after my divorce, you know, I went through all that you know, sex change because in the next sentence, I've got the sex change. All that's gone. Now, the sex change was from uh, not very often to nothing at all. Uh, so let's kind of just get rid of that, some of this. So I had a sex change, make it nice and simple. I had a sex change. I hope you're following that. I had a sex change. Was from, or there's some bad English. And okay, so we want to say, and, and get rid of the was. And also not my gender, that's the joke. You don't want to tell them the punchline uh, of it if they're not going to get, you know, you don't have to explain it. The point was, is... Uh, that it wasn't a sex change in organs, it was a sex change in frequency. Don't repeat the target, the, the expected meaning at the end of your, your, your punchline. That just doesn't make any sense. So, okay, let's kind of clean up the rest of this. It can make it just a little shorter, you know, and uh, just get the language shorter. So uh, I had a sex change from very seldom to not at all. Just shortened a few little phrases there. Wow. Now we have a tight joke. After my divorce, I had a sex change from very seldom to not at all. Wow, that is now a tight joke. And it doesn't matter where you put it. You can put it in the middle of a story. Uh, you can do it as a one-liner. You can, you know, et cetera. Any place you are doing stand-up comedy, even if you're doing commentary on uh, uh genders and pronouns and stuff you could still do this joke very cleanly and easily there it is long setup long and then we just end up with this wow there we go fixed a joke knowledge it's about knowledge i, I did a video one time it's called why are uh, open micers not funny and it, it, my answer wasn't uh, that they're, they're untalented I, I basically said they're talented they're committed they're into it uh you know, they're, they're funny, uh, their talent, there's everything, all the things they need, it's all there, <clears throat> except knowledge. That was the point of that. Oh, they're, you know, they're excellent at what they do and they would get there faster with the proper knowledge, with the proper information of practicing, knowing and practicing uh, the fundamentals, which is what this class is about. 
The next thing is writing jokes. Oh, are we going to write jokes? Well, we're going to come close to it. Not perfectly and completely, but I had to develop an original joke writing system because the other one uh, that I went through, the two list system, uh, is very inexplicit. In other words, if you knew how to write jokes, it helped you write jokes. If you didn't know how to write jokes, it was nothing. And that wasn't good enough for me. That's why I started this. So I ended up, uh, it took me many, many years. That was probably 20 five years to uh, get to I had a uh, now I have four different joke writing systems uh, but this one in particular one teaches you how to write a one-liner and I teach it in this class uh, and I'm going to go over it but developing a writing system it's called the joke prospector there's two parts uh, where you go from topic to setups and uh, then part two which is called the joke mine is from setup to writing punches so here we go. This is what we're going to do now is the, just the second part. We're just going to do the second part, the joke mine of writing jokes from setup to writing punches. Over here are the three mechanisms, but I'm just going to talk you through the steps of this system. The first step, of course, is have a setup. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the next step is to say, what's the primary assumption uh, that people make about this joke? What's what, what do you know, what, what's the expected meaning of this? expected meaning is that you took him out to dinner there could be others but that's the one we're going to work on here and then you have to go okay what in the setup caused me to make that assumption uh, so, oh oh what's the one thing with two meanings oh it's took out shortcut took my father out really but we're going to shortcut it and say took out next is let's write down some unexpected meanings okay here are several to show you how this works kill for Father's Day, I took my father out. But you, now you got to write a punch. So you know, for Father's Day, I took my father out with a 45 automatic. Why is this called a joke mine? Because if we move forward in this and we choose a different meaning, unexpected meaning hit, we can write a different punch for that, which is, you know, for Father's Day, I took my father out with a right cross. Oh, let's keep going. You removed him from something. For Father's Day, I took my father out of an urn. Wow. Let's keep pushing it. This is a mine. Every shaft you go down to, it's it branches off. It's really fun and amazing. Date. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can get sick here. For Father's Day, I took my father out. The goodnight kiss was awkward. Well, there you go. And it goes further. We could back up and say, oh, what's another uh, expected meaning? Expected meaning of father is really the man who raised you or your biological father. Oh, what's another unexpected of, of uh, meaning of father? Priest. I didn't like the way he did mass. Once you understand these mechanisms, it's easy to write jokes. The hard part is writing those jokes that reveal something about you that's hilarious and about human beings that is hilarious. You're going to write a lot of okay jokes. It's finding those great jokes. Those are the ones you're looking for. And so you just got to like, like, write a great deal of jokes uh, for a long time, and then you'll really learn how to do it. But now I can just teach you. Back to the uh, developing the fundamentals, modeling the basics. In other words, how do I go about finding those basics and where are they and what are they? I, that was the fun part, really. <laughs> Took a lot of years, but it was the fun part. Uh, here's what I developed was a model for this. Was I identify a technique, identify one that, that, uh, that had a name. Sometimes he didn't have a name. I go, oh, that's that technique. Okay. Then from there, I'd have to create an exercise, a practice exercise, so you could learn it. Not just learn the name of it or what it did, but to actually get it in your neurology by, by practicing it, being able to actually do it. It's like the difference between knowing what riding a unicycle is and being able to ride a unicycle. You needed to practice. Then what you did, create an exercise. And then once you did that exercise a whole bunch, you then develop that technique as a skill, which is something you can do. Now you can go out and practice and you can also apply it to your sense of humor. Not my sense of humor, to your sense of humor, your way of doing it. 
I want you to experiment with these techniques and do something with it I never thought of. That's my favorite thing is watch a student do, you know, have ideas beyond mine. Give them the technique. They got so good at it, they thought other found other ways of working with it. Fantastic. I write it down and teach it. So next is uh, organizing a professional curriculum. I always had a curriculum. I always had a book, a workbook, always. From the very first time I taught, I always had something. They weren't the things I have now, but there was always something specific because originally I started out teaching that three, that two list system uh, that I couldn't, yeah, you know, couldn't teach because half the people didn't didn't get it, and that was unacceptable to me. So that's why I'm on this journey now. <laughs> so here it is, the curriculum, uh, level one. How to uh, how to uh, build a, a routine? No, well, we're assuming stand-up comedy in this class. Number one over here. I'm going to teach you joke structure right away. You'll learn it. You'll learn the joke structure. And then I'm going to teach you how to write joke, uh, the punches, punch lines. We're going to write punch lines from a setup I supply. You're going to learn the four principles performing, and then you're going to learn how to write a proper premise. Very important. And then get up and rant. One minute rant just to get you up in front of people. Now, I'm going to ask you to do 10 minutes a day, uh, six days a week. That's what I ask my students. Give me an hour a week, 10 minutes a day, six days a week. So it doesn't become uh, overwhelming. There's just a little bit every day. So the next week we'll go over the premise and and the uh, the ranting again. Okay, then we'll do the uh, the assignment. Will the the punch lines that you wrote? We will go over and diagram them and look at them and talk about whether or not how they're well written. And there are. Uh, uh, five uh, guidelines for writing the punches for you to follow. It's just not out of nowhere. There's there's guidelines for that. Then you're going to learn how to write setups guidelines for that as well. Okay, then we're going to start in the fundamentals of telling funny stories. There is a lot to that. Okay, that you have to understand that there's a lot of staging. There's, you know, because it's really you can tell a story with one-liners and that's fine but once you leave and you start developing a scene that you're going to act out this whole process becomes a lot more complicated and i'm going to teach you the fundamentals the basics of this and there are quite a few and then the next uh, class three we're going to go over those again and then we're going to go over the assignment here the uh, there was uh, the writing of the setups we're going to go over that assignment and then we're going to turn one-liners into scene work so you can see the joke structure is exactly the same for a one-liner as it is scene work. There's always one thing with two meanings, you know, except that, you know, one, one person says the, set, the setup and the other one says the punch. So it gets a little bit more elaborate. My rehearsal process will go into that so that I can teach you how to turn all of your material into a scene so you can remember it naturally. We'll go over the rehearsal process again. And then we're, you're going to bring in part of your routine and we're going to rewrite it and we're going to rehearse it and then you're going to perform it in class again 10 minutes a day we're going to review that script again i'm going to teach you solution feedback solution feedback is very important i do not allow criticism uh negative criticism and opinions in my classrooms uh very important first of all criticism just make you know you go that sucked that was terrible this makes people defensive because they worked hard on their stuff what they want is an answer to how to fix it and that's what it is I'm saying is solution feedback. So the rule is basically, if you can't add to it, if you can't add a joke, a tag, a fix of some kind, don't talk. Uh, don't, don't get involved with it. Your opinion of whether it's funny or not isn't relevant. Okay, that comedian already stood in the roar of silence. They don't need somebody going, well, that joke wasn't fun. They, and they know, they know, they already know. What they want to do is to become less scared and know how to fix it to get a laugh or how to rewrite it to get a laugh or maybe to edit it, okay? What they need a solution, not criticism that, that, that uh, puts them down. Okay, I'm not about uh, not coddling anybody. Nobody, nobody gets a, a participation trophy. What you do is you get the answer to what to work on. That's why all the rest of this technique is here. So I can go say, go and work on this. This is where the answer is to fixing that. Oh, 
and then they got to go work on their technique. And then when I teach you, you can then in, in, in the level two classes and some in the level one start to uh, uh, give people solution feedback and help them. It's amazing that you help somebody. You can say, oh, if you tried this, that, you know, and then they see the logic of it, they'll go, wow, thanks. Oh, that's kind of nice, isn't it? Then uh, uh, we're, we're going to do the rehearsal process again, you know, making sure everything is a scene so that you're having normal memory. Okay. And uh, then we're going to put together your one minute routine. You'll have a short routine. Yeah. People say one minute, wait until you do this. Putting together a one minute routine is a lot of work, but if you can do one minute and you know how you did that one minute, you knew you learned all these other things to put together that one minute. You can then do two and three and five and 10 and 15, because now you've got the skills of how to do it. You know how you did it. Okay. Yeah. It's short. Fine. Some people have criticized me for that and stuff. And I, I just think you're wrong. I'm telling you, if you get, if you can build a one minute, minute routine that has five plus laughs per minute, which is what I'm going to be pushing you to do by learning these techniques and tagging jokes and doing act outs. Yeah. Longer routines are not that much work. You can actually work, work on material without me around. Okay. The level two class is just to accelerate that process of getting there much, much faster. So next writing an interactive workbook. There's a workbook with this. Okay. It is printable and it's fillable. Some people on their laptops or uh, pads of some kind, or even on their phones actually do this because it's fillable a PDF fillable. So know that there's a workbook with everything I'm teaching you is right there in front of you. You can review it, read it, do the exercises. We'll do the exercises in class and then you go and do them. And then you come back and we go over those exercises again in class. And I correct you and I help you. And I point out how you need to improve it and how you didn't adhere to some guidelines of some kind or not working with one of the techniques and improve what you're doing. There's answers rather than criticism. The techniques lead to answers that are easy to give people that they can work on. This is Sally Mullins, one of my students from, from, from some time ago. I won't say how long ago. <laughs> Here's what she said. Hey, I'm Sally Mullins. I'm a professional stand-up comedian. I've been a comedian for over 20 years. My first comedy teacher was Greg Dean. I recommend Greg Dean to everyone. He's basically the reason I'm doing stand-up. I got into his methods right away. He really honed my writing ability. And also he was just a great life coach at the time before we even had life coaches. He convinced me stay in the game. Um, if you study with Greg Dean, you know he's just very inspirational. <laughs> I really just enjoy drinking, which sounds better than I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I don't drink like I used to. Actually, I sometimes drink like I used to, to remind myself I don't. <laughs> a lot of people think I should have chilled out on my drinking years ago. I would have made different choices. But you know what? You can't regret what you don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> she cracks me up. Anyway, so a very nice lady. I'm you know, friends with her now because uh, I run into her at the clubs all the time. She performs so much here in the Southern California area. So for you, you're, you're, you're going to say this, not me. Why should I take a class instead of just doing the open mics? A lot of people ask that. They ask me all the time. So let me give you some answers here. First of all, open mics used to be the only, uh, the only training ground. When I was coming up, uh, that was it. And the open mic, you know, and there was some one and you just went around and did as many as you could all the time and so on and so forth. That's, you know, uh, hopefully somebody took you under their wing and taught you something, but, uh, that's the way it used to be. Not that way anymore. Now there's a class like this one that can teach you stuff. Okay. Uh, uh, learn the fundamentals. It's the only shortcut. Like I said before, you know, uh, it's, it's, some of my students say that they, you know, that they think they've, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a six to eight year shortcut uh, because you don't have to learn what to do. You spend, people spend a lot of years learning what they're supposed to do and then getting good at, at how to do those things. Here, I'm going to teach you the what and the how. 
Now you just got to get good at it. You still got to put in your stage time. There is no substitution for stage time at all. You know, it's a safe place to experiment. People put things in my class, crazy stuff. Okay, I really think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sam Kennison or uh, uh, even Andy Kaufman could have developed in my classes because I would have let them do that crazy stuff. It's all right with me. And I've had stuff in my classes that are crazier than their stuff. No criticism. We talked about this before. Solution feedback. Gosh, that's so important because you get out in the, in, in the open mics, people will crush you with their opinions. And please believe me, don't go to your friends and relatives asking for, for you know, because they think what you want is criticism and they'll, they'll, uh, uh, they'll criticize the joy right, right the hell out of that show so fast. so the fixes the fixes are techniques based uh, are technique based and i'm going to explain it i'll help you fix something and then say remember this technique you learned here that's what i'm applying now i did part of it you go home and do the rest i'm not going to do i'll do it with you won't do it for you because then you won't learn there's a thing called a, a teacher dependent, teacher independent teaching. I do teacher independent teaching. When my students leave me, they're able to do these things. You know, they stay with me longer because they want to accelerate the, pro the process to get there so much faster, which is also something else that we do. Next is uh, get professional support on and off stage. One of the people is my wife, Gayla Johnson, which you'll see in a minute. She's a headlining comedian, has an album, a Showtime special. Uh, she, she teaches some of the classes and stuff. And as well as uh, I kind of have a group of professionals that hang around a lot and drop into classes all the time and help write jokes and do things. And then uh, you get their support and you'll run into them in the clubs, et cetera. Let, them, let the people know you're a Greg Dean student. A lot of them will give you, a, it's a better chance of getting on stage with them because I'm so tough on people that they have good etiquette and they get off on stage on time and that they have a show. People go, wow, this person has a show. We'll give them a shot. I gotta have a show. Okay, and quickly move past the open mics and get books in good comedy rooms. This is huge. Like I was just saying, when they see you have a show, a show. Okay, these bookers will give you a shot at things that, you know, because you know, so many people come to you, I'm really good, and they don't know what they're doing at all. They don't even have a show. They don't even have jokes. <laughs> they might have a story, but there's no, I mean, I'm just telling you, at open, you go in with the show, and the more you're with me, the longer that show, the better the show, the tighter the show, they see that. And then a lot of my students go, wow, I moved past the open mics within a couple of months. I was booking all of these shows around town. Then you got to worry about bringer rooms and not being exploited by producers of bringer rooms. That's a whole nother conversation of people that, that, that uh, bring you in and bring all your, your, your friends to the show and uh, take all the money and uh, and they don't necessarily have a good show so you got to be uh, very uh, precise about who you pick with that now let's talk about telling funny stories because most people come to me i want to tell funny stories i get it i understand you do i did too everybody does and they go why are you teaching me one-liners in the beginning because if you can't understand the joke structure of a one-liner you're never going to get it when you start putting it into a story story is far more complex one-liners are, are only one of the many ways to communicate funny to storytelling is far more complex as there are more techniques used to get the laughs okay let's go there's you got to set up situations there's situations in, you know, in those things you got to portray the characters you got to play portray all the roles not just yours you got to play all the roles you got to write jokes for the scenes and for the characters it's got to come from their point of view it's different staging those act out staging that scene you know i people see people stage the scene all the time and screw up the comedy and sometimes just you can't even follow the story a lot of technique behind that okay and performing it all yourself this is a lot there's it's a lot more so we take you step by step and teach you the fundamentals learn what a joke is and how to write a few jokes and then we start showing you how to build now building funny stories so here is my wife, Gayla Johnson. Uh, this is one of her, her this from her Showtime special. I'll just let you watch it and then we'll talk about it. 
it's find something nice to say when you're gonna compliment a woman. You know, you say, oh, hi, you're a nice looking young lady. I'm, you look very nice tonight, very neat. Don't come up to me like, I like your tits. I'm so glad, hey, you know what? If you're really that fond of them and you wanna take one with you? the falsies routine yeah that came about because uh i was at a club just performing and a guy came up to me and actually asked me like you know like you got some nice you know get a nice rack and so i, I just kind of responded in the moment like okay you, you want to take it with you and just sort of handed him like a falsy um uh it just grew into a routine after that uh it got some laughs and i just did greg's rehearsal technique and did his character and found out what he would say and did my character found out how i would respond and it just kind of get adding jokes and adding jokes until it became that whole routine <laughs> what i love most about that piece is the whole front row buckling forward with laughter during that last section that's fun you know it starts out like she said a very simple idea it's like adding clothes on a clothes rack she may have had one joke on there, but it really what it's about is you just keep adding jokes to that clothes rack. Pretty soon you have the story that's got tons of jokes in it. It's not written, it's developed over time. And the more you work on it, the more you find those jokes. Next, assembling a routine. There are techniques for this as well. You get a bunch of jokes and so on and so forth. First thing you have to do is learn how to rate your jokes, learn your ABCs. So, your uh, A jokes get the biggest laughs, the B jokes get strong laughs, the C jokes are your uh, weakest or just good laughs, okay? Does that make sense? So once you get that, then you've got to learn your BCAs. <laughs> you start with your B material, you open with it. So it's strong, but not your best stuff. You put your C material in the middle, you know, and then you close with your A material, B, C, A. I just worked with a whole bunch of my students last week because uh, we we're going to go to the improv this this uh, weekend and perform. And uh, they were like, oh, well, the show is uneven. That's right. And I pointed out, oh, it's funnier here than there. You want to end with your funniest stuff? Go back, rearrange it. And they did. I rearranged it, B, C, A. And the show flowed so much better. Next is managing stage fright. Huge, huge stand-up is terrifying. I get it. <laughs> I did it. Everybody who's done stand up knows it's terrifying. It's night's sleep, your heart pounding, the gut thing, all that kind of thing. But the difference is, are you going to let, you know, fear win? And what I find is that when you let fear win, you just get good at letting fear win. If you don't let fear win, you get better and better at not letting fear win. And it's not as hard. It really isn't. As time goes on, it's better, you know? So, with the uh, stage fright the butterflies may never go away but with a bunch of practice you know you may be able to train them to fly in formation so they're all excited and going toward being funny rather than all over the place overcoming the fear of the unknown unknown is huge huge how do we face that we do that a couple of ways one is repeated in class performances seeing other people perform you getting up and performing over and over and over again okay and sitting in and the uh, level one people in live classes and the uh, uh, other classes you're welcome to sit in the uh, level two classes for free we just allow people to do that, okay? So you can get two classes for the price of one. You don't perform in level two, but you get to sit there and watch it and watch how I work with people. Next is defeat the fear of feeling unprepared. One of the biggest uh, fears for life. If you're feeling unprepared, fear is is overwhelming. But when you're feeling prepared, like I think this, you know, I got and you got repeated evidence that it works. This goes a long ways. Okay, 
you know, build a killer routine and you start to get confidence in that and so on. And you, we also have a free supportive open mic online. It's on Zoom, but you can come in and do that as well. I mean, all these things we keep offering to help you along that path because we understand the path. You know, if you're an aspiring comedian, you really want to go out there and do this, the tools are here. All of this gives you the courage to get on stage. All of the tools are here. We're here. We understand the path. Next is performing with confidence. Isn't that what you want? Be able to get up there and like, oh, oh I don't care. I know what I'm doing. Now, that's what that's the point at which this becomes just a huge blast. You'll still be scared in the beginning, but my, I tell you what, a lot of it goes away, especially when you get on stage. You got to deal with the stage fright before you get on stage. Once you're on stage, it just goes away. It's, it's like it's like magic. It's the weirdest thing in the world. Performing with confidence. Here we go. Understanding. This is what does it. Understanding how jokes work. You know it's a joke. I can't guarantee anybody's going to laugh at it. But when you when you get on stage with your show, you, what I can guarantee is what you're going on stage is with jokes. They will be jokes because we understand joke structure. They will be jokes. Go and watch the open mics. Most of the people up there, what they're saying, in my opinion, when I go and see them, they're not jokes and they're not getting laughs. Uh, learning five ways to generate material. Writing is only one way. Like I said before, it's developed in storytelling and rehearsals and all kinds of ways. So, uh, ranting, all these ways are ways of generating material. Five, five ways of generating material. You'll learn in this class, all right? Practice the performing techniques. We're going to get you to be up and practice them every single week. You're going to be up on stage going through stuff, okay? And they're going to be exercises for the different techniques. All right, until the last two weeks. Have a routine that's five plus laughs per minute because that's what I'm asking you to do. Oh, and they're actually jokes. Mmm, powerful. And you know you can get laughs. Isn't that what it's about? At the end of my, my, my classes, I usually say, you know, I ask them, hey, everybody, do you feel like you can now after this class and you've been through all this, you feel like you can, you can really do that? And they're all like, yes, yes. And they're like, yeah. I really, I can get those laughs. I, I can see it. And are they great at everything? No, not yet. <laughs> You're just learning a whole bunch of skills. That's not the point. The point is to know what they are and to work on them and to have them, have the skills. Okay. This is Richard Villa. He's all over Southern California, but he's also one of the most popular uh, comedians in, in Mexico and, uh, and Latin America in general. Here we go. Hey guys, it's Richard V. I've been doing comedy for 13 years and my eyes opened up when I met Greg Dean and his method of teaching comedy and comedy writing. You know, after 13 years, you learn a lot, but there's so many things that I'm missing. I never knew the fundamentals. I didn't know I never knew the basics. And once I started implementing his formula on how to write jokes, how to structure them, it's really helped me a lot. I, I've now worked with Rob Schneider's new show, Real Rob. I've gone internationally. I've been working now doing stand-up in Mexico. And that's amazing because the system works regardless of what language you talk because we're talking funny and funny is funny. Yeah, Richard came to me originally for a private session and he learned so much. He said, what should I do? And I said, well, take my level one class. And he went, well, I've been doing this 13 years. And I went, you have to trust me. And after every class, every single class in this level one, he came to me and said, where were you 13 years ago? Oh my gosh. Some of these things I'm realizing I do, but didn't even know I did them. And now I can do them whenever I want to do them. Oh my goodness sakes. So anyway, the next thing is there is work out there. There is work. First, the four C's. The four C's are clubs, colleges, cruise ships, and corporations. Clubs are where you'll get your first work. Okay, then you're gonna to work toward colleges and yeah, a little harder these days with everything being so, you know, I'm offended kind of stuff. Cruise ships are great, but you gotta have a lot of material and corporations it's gotta be squeaky clean, but you could make thousands. I've got many friends of mine that make like $15,000 for 45 minutes work. And I am not kidding. I am, and some, and I work all the time doing corporate stuff. So, and I trained them. They're not just people that I know. They are my former students. So in Hollywood, there's all these things. There's comedy specials. There's all these ways you can do. You look at this list later if you want to and review this. Talk shows. Talk shows are all comedians now. 
Okay, sitcoms. Sitcoms are based around a lot of them around comedians or have comedians in them. What most people don't know is most of the writers are former comedians and executive producers and stuff are former stand-up comedians and the warm-ups too. Sketch shows, same thing. You know, host, appearances, writers, warm-up. I mean, it, once they learn that you know how to write jokes, write good, tight, well put together jokes and you can come up with them regularly, there's a place and there's places to get work in this town. Okay, game shows, that's a new one. Now they, they had to replace the older the older guard that was passing away and they got comedians. <laughs> you know, and they all, and before that, a lot of my comedian friends were actually auditioning for these shows and stuff. So in the writers for them and warm up for them, movies, acting roles, writers, directors, Judd Apatow, you know, Steve, I mean, go through the list of great comedians that have done them, you know, Tim Allen, whom I know, uh, all these people have, <laughs> taken stand up and turn them into these lucrative Hollywood careers. So there's work out there for people that can get up and make a group of people laugh and know how to write jokes. So how to become a comedian? Well, look at all of these people, look at all of them. You know, three or four or five of them are my students. Uh, several of them are just my friends. A bunch of them I just know, and a bunch of them I don't know. But here's what you need to know. Whoever your favorite comedian is, at the beginning of their career, they were you. There were someone with a normal job that wanted to become a comedian. They were an aspiring comedian, just like you, I guarantee it. Talk to each and you talk to every one of them. And go, yeah, I started out this, I was working at a bank, I was doing this, I was parking cars. I'm... They're, they're no different than you. So I'm saying this, there's, there's no, they just, they just got dedicated and stayed at it for years and didn't get disturbed, didn't, and didn't get discouraged. Just kept at it and kept at it, okay? Some of them got really famous and some of them made a good living, okay? That's the part of the breaks. Everybody doesn't get super famous, okay? Imagine taking your first step to turning your dreams into reality. That is this class. Level one, how to write a routine. That is this class. That's what it's built for. 40 years of experience in building all of these skills and techniques uh, and, and principles that you'll follow as well in order to get you there. There's a path. If you wanna get out there and share the laughter, you know, class one, you'll learn to write jokes. Class two, you'll be telling funny stories. Class three, you'll start writing a routine. In class four, you'll practice your routine. And by class five, you'll have a completed routine. That's what it's about. It's a step-by-step -step process. Of course, it varies by how much people put in their time and effort, but the people who put in the time and effort get huge results from this class. And I've been, you know, it's just so much fun to watch them because I get to go out to the clubs all the time and see, every time I go to a club, I see four or five of my students performing or there or hanging out or about to perform every club in Southern California. I can never go to a club without Southern California. And some of them are very famous. You can learn in five weeks what would take you five years, five weeks or five years. It's a pretty good deal. Okay, some bonuses with this whole thing. You know, there's a bunch of things that you get, okay? There's a free PDF workbook for your assignments, okay? Uh, there's phone support on the assignments. There's Slack support and phone support. I have everybody on Slack. If you don't know what it is, it's kind of an internet thing for in, in, inside circle of people and stuff. And I answer their questions. Oh, they can get a hold of me on it. I'm there for you. I really am. Next is you can make up classes because we have video backups of these classes. I always teach the same thing each week, the, the same curriculum. So if you miss a class, we'll supply a video that has that class if you miss it, or if you just wanna review it, we just automatically send you that review class. Automatically, it's part of the whole service that we give people. Direct messaging, that's a slacking. You can direct a message me and everybody else in the class. You can talk to them. You, a bunch of my students get together on Slack and they go to uh, shows and open mics together and support groups and writing groups because we're building a community here for you. 
You can sit in for free on my level two advanced class. Sit in for free. Again, you're not going to perform, but if you learn how to do it right, you can start giving feedback, solution feedback, pitching jokes, learning how to do that. Powerful, because once other comedians find out you know how to pitch jokes and help them with their shows, they all want you in their writing group. Because I get a lot of people building writing groups around town. And a 15 minute, if you wanted a 15 minute consultation with me, all these things are free. They come as part of the price of this whole thing. Here's what you need to do is take the rocking chair test. Here's the rocking chair test. When you say to yourself, when I was young, I'm sure glad I gave up on my dreams. I was right not to spend a few bucks that might have changed my life. I'm sitting here old and I'm glad I did that. Is it, if that's the test, if that's what you're doing is going, yeah, when I'm older, I'm glad I didn't do this. Then don't do it. But if you think you're going to have regrets, then take this step because it is a step-by-step -step something you can do that anybody can do and you can learn and you can get on the path to making your dreams come true learn to share the laughter it's in person in santa monica it's on zoom live classes taught by my wife gala the price is 2.99 five weeks to your dreams okay seating is limited we do fill up i don't take everybody we fill up and we fill up quite often and fight very fairly quickly get in there and get this class if this is what you want to do or you know join with us all you got to do is go to up in the right hand corner of this video is that i that'll lead you to standupcomedy.com or go on your browser and go to standupcomedy.com or the link is in the description below to get to standupcomedy.com that's my website all right or just sit there in your rocking chair until you're 60 or 70 or 80. You know, it's your choice and it is a choice. And there's always something that's gonna get in the way. Do you want stuff to get in the way until you're old and in your rocking chair? You're gonna get out of that rocking chair and take some action. Thank you for signing up and uh, checking out this level one webinar. I hope to see you in class. And remember, laughter is contagious. Pass it on.